If you could see what I once was, if you could go with me back to where I started from, then I know you would see the miracle of love that brought me gently to this place. I'm here to say I'm nothing but an old sinner saved by grace. I'm just a this Wednesday night. Turn to the back of the book, no page number, but at Calvary. And let's stand together in the fly leaf of your hymnal at Calvary. Let's stand together sing the first, second, and last of at Calvary.
good to see you tonight. Turn around and smile and wave at somebody. If you're close, shake hands as the pastor comes. God for Calvary. Thank God for you being here tonight on this Wednesday night. We appreciate each and every one here. And if you're visiting for the first time, lift your hand and the ushers will bring you a card. Fill it out. Drop it in the offering bag in a little bit. Master Club's downstairs. I pray for the workers and the children. And then Sunday school, Sunday and preaching. We'll be having Sunday school and preaching this coming Sunday, but no evening service. And I'm looking forward to a great day for Easter. And then next Tuesday, next Tuesday evening at 6.30, we want to ask as many men and boys that will come by. And they wanna, we want to set up for the homecoming uh, that next Sunday. We've got a lot going on this coming week now. And there'll be no Wednesday service next week because we're going to have a reunion choir practice over at the other church Thursday night. And then on Friday night, we're going to be there for the service itself. And we're going to have a great time. I believe we'll have a good uh, crowd there and have a good time in the Lord, remembering some of the great things God's done. That's 110 Montana Street in City View. And don't go to the wrong church. One fellow said he would have gone to the wrong place if we hadn't given him the address. So be sure you know where you're going there. And uh, there will be a, that reunion choir practice. That's Thursday now at 630 at the City View Church. So choir, remember that. So this is our 55th anniversary. That's next week. And I'm telling you, I'm just so thankful to God for what he has done, for what he is doing, and what he's going to do. I'm trusting him. But be sure and remember, Friday night, tell your friends about it. And then Sunday, uh, the homecoming, the regular homecoming, and the primitives will be here to sing for us, our special guests. And then after the singing, we'll go down to the gym and have our feast and fellowship. So bring your food to church with you on homecoming day. That is the 24th. And uh, put it in the gym. Put your food in the gym. And we'll go down and have a good time after that. Uh, then let me remind you this now. Vacation Bible School is coming up June the 13th through the 17th. And there is now a flyer with a QR code in the foyer that you can scan using uh, the phone to register your children. And if you have any questions, see Braden Smith. And then tonight, we want to pray especially for Ronnie Shackelford. I understand he's under the weather. And we want to pray for Jeremy and Jennifer Wakefield. And then David Taylor and his wife, uh, David and Taylor, father, uh, they have a new baby. And be praying for the baby and for uh, these parents. Then David Taylor uh, is in the hospital. And uh, they're working on him. Pray for him. Vicki Guy, Ann Kay, Johnny Hembry. Uh, Nick Papala, Danny Black, Brenda Alexander, Carol Clark, Loretta Fowler, Roy Pettit, Kathy Pettit, Zelda Bishop, Dee Hall, Sybil Kelly. Glad to see Sybil out tonight. And then David Schwanger, Walker Brookshire, Jack Thomas, Judy Moody, Heather McKinney, Louise Carlton, Catherine Davis, Eric Stevens, Sidney Kleiman, Carol Center, Jimmy Thompson, Eunice Pridmore, Christian Brown, Randy Key, Hazel Thomas, Butch McCone, Jimmy McCall, Steve Wakefield, Danny Burton, Roy and Pearl Barrett, Shelby Soros, Stephanie Milhouse, Tony Moore, uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry McMahon, and Elizabeth Holcomb, Stan Edwards, and then our sheriff of the Greenville County, Hobart Lewis, has sent a request in. We want to pray for our sheriff. I don't know exactly what it's all about, but he wants us to be praying for him good sheriff we've got. Praise the Lord for him. All right, ushers, you come. We'll receive an offering for our sign, and you just give whatever the Lord lays upon your heart. We appreciate what you've already done. Brother Jack Roberts, lead us in the word. Our precious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to you again tonight, we just come, Lord, with thanksgiving in our heart. Yes. Lord, we just think back uh, where our church started from, the little uh, one-room shack over in the back alley, Woodside Mill, that our pastor started. And, Lord, we just praise you for that, and look what you've blessed us with now. Yes. And we thank so thankful for it, Lord. We're so thankful for that choir. that they had been many prayers sent up about our choir, Lord. I remember our pastor talking about praying for a choir. And, Lord, how you blessed us with a good choir and good choir leaders. And our musicians, Father, we pray your blessings upon each and every one. 
And Father, all these here and now on this prayer list, uh, you know each name and each need. Amen. And we just ask that you comfort and do for them that needs to be done, Father, and we'll thank you for that. And I thank you for what we're about to receive, Lord, for we ask all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Amen.
you've been blessed, say amen. 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 Well, we surely have been blessed. Praise His holy name. And we didn't take nothing from our journey now. I want you to turn for a, a minute or two here uh, to Ephesians chapter number 2 on page 1251. Page 1251 in the Old Schofield Bible. <coughs> Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 1. And you hath he quickened, and that word quickened means made alive, and you <coughs> who he hath quickened who were, who were dead in trespasses and sins. And I want to talk just a little bit tonight and praise his holy name for being alive from the dead. We were dead. We were, but not now. Praise God. That's gone. That's forever gone from you and me. We'll never, ever die except the body. The body will die someday, but we will not. We have eternal and everlasting life, and all that the devil can do and all the, devil, all the lies the devil can tell cannot change what God said. We were dead, but we're not dead anymore. Now, I want to say, my friend, every person in this building tonight, you're either saved or unsaved. You're either saved or lost. There's no middle ground. Uh, you're either God's child or the devil's child. And my friend, you and I tonight, honestly, I believe that everybody in this house of God is a child of God. Now, I may be wrong. I may be wrong. There may be some people here tonight or somebody or an individual. You're not saved. Well, if you're not saved, you can be saved before you leave this place. And I want to tell you something, friend. If you've ever lived in sin, deep sin, and got delivered by the grace of God, hallelujah, you will never, ever get over it. I mean, you may stagger around, falter around, fall all over the, all over the rock, but you'll never fall off the rock. You're on the rock, solid the Lord Jesus Himself. Now, there's no middle ground, no middle ground. Uh, when it comes to our life, uh, when it comes to life and death, you're either alive or dead. When it comes to the physical, those that are dead physically are in the graveyard, their bodies are, and their souls in eternity. And right here tonight, you are either alive spiritually or you're dead. And so you need to check your heart and see where you are. And if you've been to Jesus, thank God you can praise His name. Boy, I tell you, that choir, they lit me up tonight. And I tell you right now, they were singing songs that touched me down deep inside. And I appreciate what they did tonight. The Scriptures make a distinction between eternal life and eternal death. Now, we all need to recognize this fact. It is a fact. Now, we are dead in sins as a law sinner without Christ. Death is a state of separation. And of course, in the physical, it is cut off from the cause and power of life physically and the spiritual the same. My friend, natural, the natural or the physical death means that the uh, body is separated from the food and the air which are necessary for him to live. And so, my friend, if you don't have food to eat, your body dies. If you don't have air to breathe, your body dies physically. So you'll be dead. You've got to have food, and you've got to have nourishment. You've got to have air to breathe. And thank God, aren't you glad your cupboard's full? Aren't you glad you can go out of this church tonight and go to your cupboard or your kitchen or whatever pantry or wherever and rather get out a peanut butter sandwich or something? I mean, there's something to eat. There's salt and crackers or something in there. Brother, we're able to eat tonight. And I give God the glory that we, are, we have the food we have. And then, my friend, the air we breathe. Now, some of us, like I have sinus problems, some of you do, and at this time of the year it gets bad sometimes. And then also bronchitis. And I have a case of that. And every once in a while my bronchitis gets really bad and it's hard to breathe. But boy, when it lets up, and when I get my breath back, I start praising God. I'm praying while it's happening, but I praise Him after it's over. I thank God that I can breathe. And I'm glad that right now, this very moment, I, hallelujah, I'm not hungry, and I'm breathing all right. Boy, I praise His name for that. You're sitting here tonight, probably you have just had supper. You're going to have it in a little bit. Thank God for it. So spiritual death is separation from the power of and the joy of heavenly things. Now, in both cases, death is a state of insensitivity. In verse number two, 
wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now the dead are helpless, they're hopeless, they are unable, they're unable to do anything. A uh, person out there in the cemetery, the body, uh, those trailer trucks going up and down the White Horse Road all day long, 24 hours a day, not disturbing them at all. That body's dead. It's insensitive. It doesn't know those noisy trucks are going up and down through there. But now if you had to go out there and camp out and sleep up beside that road, you probably wouldn't get any sleep, especially until you got used to it. That noise would keep you up because you're alive. So my friend, a, a dead person is insensitive to the things of life. And then when it comes to, you know, religion, when it comes to spirituality, some people think we're crazy. They don't think that we got good sense. They think we've gone off our rocker. Why? Because we're happy? Because we say hallelujah? Because we say praise the Lord? And we're just praising God. Well, what are they praising God for? They can't see Him. Even the Bible tells you that even though we haven't seen Him, we love. But we're going to see Him visibly one glorious day. But see, they don't understand that. Why? Because they're dead. But you and I are alive. Now, some of you live people tonight, I begin to doubt you every now and then because you're as dry as shucks, and I don't know what it'd take to make you smile. I don't know what it'd take to make you say hallelujah. You just got your own old stubborn way, and you're not going to change. You're not going to change for God or Jesus, the Holy Ghost, or anybody. You're just going to be the way you are till you die. And boy, when they put you in that grave, <laughs> This world's going to take a sigh of relief. That dry, hide rascal's gone. I don't know what it'll happen, but listen, praise God. I know some of us have a, a more forward, uh, you know, personality, but listen, smile. God help you to smile every now and then. Don't you have something to smile about? Don't you have something to praise God about? I mean, look at what you've got. Think about it. Think about it tonight. Think about the automobile you drove to church tonight. Boy, God gave you that. Think about the church you had to come to. Praise God, you didn't go to some old dry ice box. You came into a place where the sweet Holy Ghost is stirring hearts and blessing souls and lifting us up and making us happy that we are who we are. I'm glad I can remember the night I got saved. Y'all, boy, y'all got me on that one tonight. I'm telling you, that stirred me up. My mind went back. My mind went back, and I've testified a hundred times of how God saved my old wretched soul, but I still appreciate it. I still can't get over it. I can't get over how I went into that church that night in Simpsonville, South Carolina. I was as heavy burdened as I'd ever been. Felt like I was just going to be mashed down. God was going to crush me in the dirt. God was going to step on me and grind me in the dirt, and I deserved it. I deserved that. But instead, I came out of there praising God. I, was, I didn't know how to shout. I didn't know how to say hallelujah. Boy, if I'd have known it that night, I'd have tore that church up. I'd have really got that church stirred, but I didn't know that. I'd been taught you keep quiet in church. You don't even breathe hardly. Keep quiet. Don't do anything. Don't move. Don't point. Now, I, I agree that some of these uh, ill-mannered things ought to be done away, but I'm going to tell you something, praise God. You ought to point up. You don't have to point over. You ought to point up. Of course, he's over there too. So if you're pointing to God, you're all right. Hallelujah. What a God. Man alive, I hope you people are warm tonight. If you get, if you get cold, if anybody gets cold, you, you're sick. Let's go get either McAfee or the Amblex one. Somebody needs to get, uh, you know, fixed up. I know it's warm in here tonight. But if you turn the air on, we'll have some complaints. I don't want that right now. Listen, God is so good. We, we, we see right here that we are saved in Ephesians 5, 6. For when we were, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. The dead are in a state of incapacity. In other words, the dead have nothing in common with the living in both cases. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desire of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. We were just like those out there living for the devil tonight. 
going to the bar, drinking their beer, raising hell, living for the devil, just out there having a big time in the world. That's where you used to be. That's where I used to be. Now, some of you were never that immoral, but some of you were. But boy, listen, we're not anymore. I haven't been to a beer joint in 50, almost 60 years now. I haven't, I haven't had a beer in almost that long, almost 60 years since I drank a beer. But you know, and I loved it better than slop, better than a hog loves slop before I got saved. But the night I got saved, boy, I was glad to get rid of it. I had something in the place of it. Boy, I was happy in the Lord. Now, those who are already dead physically are in eternity. Every one of our church members, I don't know how many, four or five hundred we buried in 55 years, and they're all in eternity. And I hope every one of them is in heaven. And I'm looking to see them in heaven. I'm not, I'm not going to go to heaven saying, where is so-and-so? Did he go to hell? I'm looking to go to heaven. And God say, here's the congregation, son. Every one of them. You say, that's impossible. You think so? Well, we'll see. I'm going to claim all my family. Boy, that family better be never let me down. This family here and that family out yonder are kin to me. Don't you let me down. You give your heart to Jesus because I'm going to look for you when I get there. I'm going to be looking for every one of them. Now, these bodies will be raised from the dead. Now, right now, if you're a saved person and you die, you go to heaven immediately. And God gives you a house, according to 2 Corinthians 5. He gives you a house to live in until he raises this body out of the cemetery and glorifies it and then reunites it with that house in heaven. You say, how's that going to be? God didn't explain it all, but he told us about it. He told us what he's going to do. So he's going to do that regardless of what anybody says about it. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51, behold, stop, look, listen, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. And this in the context, sleep is death. And he says, we shall not be dead when the rapture takes place. We're not going to all be sleeping, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal immortality. So like uh, life is the only remedy for death. Now, Christians have eternal life as far as the spiritual life goes. And when the body dies, they live on. They don't die with the body. They go on to heaven. In 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we are competent, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, that's the book. That's the Bible. Also, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21, Paul said, For me to live is Christ. Living here is just living for Jesus. But he said, To die would be gain. You don't lose anything when you die as a Christian. The Bible says that uh, the death of the saint is precious to God. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So Jesus told the story of a, of a rich man but didn't get saved. Uh, I mean, listen, you don't believe in hell, but you don't believe in Jesus. Because Jesus, and we preached on this the other day, Jesus told about a man in Luke 16 that was rich and fared sumptuously every day, clothed, fine clothing, had everything this world could offer, but he died. And Jesus said, in hell, in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torment. Now, mother, to say there's no hell, you're a fool. You're a fool to say there's no hell. Jesus said it. I got it right here in black and white. You say, well, that book was written by me, and no, men penned it for the Holy Ghost, but the Holy Ghost gave every word, every jot, every tittle. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, the Bible says. So he didn't go to hell because he was rich. He didn't go to hell because he was a, was a, 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 had everything this world could ever offer. He didn't go to hell because he had a good time while he was here on this earth. He went to hell because he, re he rejected God. He would not get saved. Hey, so he went to hell, and he's there now, and will be there for all eternity. 
Think about that. Is that what you want to happen to you? To be there for all eternity? God help you to wake up while you can. And we got people listening by screaming there. You need to wake up. Many of you out there, you need to get saved. Hey, time's running out. This world's going to wind up one day pretty soon. Where are you going to be? You'll either be in heaven or hell, as surely as I'm talking to you. All non-Christians will one day stand before God's throne to be judged for their rejection of Christ. All Christians now, according to 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in the body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now that's talking to Christians, and that's talking about stewardship and not guilt of sin. And then over there in Revelation 20, in verse 11, talks about the non-Christian, and he says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was not found, there was found no place for them. Think about standing for a holy God, and there's no place for you in God's kingdom, in God's way, none whatsoever. Listen, those people, you know, tamper with God's word and try to change it, pen mouth it and all. You know, God said over in Revelation, I'll take their name out of the book of life. All right? They won't have a place to stand. The book of life, won't, their name won't even be in the book of life. Now, you can't have your name taken out of the Lamb's book of life, but he can take your name out of the book of life, and you'll be lost forever. Brother, the book of life is your name from the time you were born, but the Lamb's book of life is when you're born again. And so you can't be taken out of the Lamb's book of life but he said he'd take their name out of the book of life. Read it for yourself. Revelation, you can interpret it any way you want to, but I'm going to tell you something. I don't want to be in that number. Ever how God does that, but he does it. All right? And he said, I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the heaven and the earth turned away, and there was no place found for them, a small and great, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead that were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. Names were not written in the book of life. God took them out for some reason, and if you tamper with his word, that's one good reason, and I got scripture for it. You say, well, it's no big deal. You better believe it's a big deal. You wait till you face God with something like that. You don't tamper with something that holy. That's not just a book. Brother, that's God's holy word. And you better treat it like God's holy word. Romans chapter 6, you know, and we're talking about the lost man, lost woman, lost boy, a girl. Listen, why don't you escape? If you're lost, why don't you escape this judgment? Why don't you escape hell fire? You can. Right now, you can escape that terrible judgment and that awful eternity in the lake of fire. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, hallelujah, there's that death, and then there's that life. And we're alive from the dead. We can't go back. We can't go back and become undone. You know, the old saying, you can't unscramble eggs. Well, you can't turn eternal life into something that's not eternal because Jesus said it. He pronounced it. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. Sam, you didn't deserve to get saved. I know your life. I know how you used to be. Yeah, but you know what? Grace is greater than sin. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And so we're saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, when a sinner, when a sinner, any sinner, I don't care who he is, puts his faith, in Jesus Christ, I'm talking about as Savior now, God imparts the gift 
of eternal life to that sinner. You say, but I know he was just an old bootlegger. He was a hellraiser. He did all this, all this corruption. He lived in sin, deep sin. But when he comes to Jesus, God imparts eternal life. He forgives him of all of his sin and gives him eternal life. Now, Romans 10, 13, we quote this a million times a year, I think. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, and this is in faith now, shall be saved. Whosoever, doesn't make that. What kind of sinner you are, how bad you've been, Jesus loves you. He died for you. So we once were far, far away from God, hopeless and helpless as we could be. But now we're near, and we have received the help that we needed. In Ephesians 2.13, but now in Christ Jesus, you sometimes were far off. You were are made nigh, are near now. How? By the blood of Christ. His blood avails for us tonight. In Ephesians 2, 19. Now therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. <coughs> that sounds good. The household of God. That's a family. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself, being the chief cornerstone. Now this was preached and declared strongly by Paul the Apostle, the greatest preacher who ever lived other than Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 2, 1 he said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. I didn't come to you acting smart and showing you my education. He had a great education, by the way. Paul did, but he didn't go strutting that. No, he went preaching in the power of the Holy Ghost, telling people how to be saved, how to go to heaven, had a burden for it. He used no tricks of oratory. He, had, he used no flights of eloquence or anything that a educated man might try on somebody to impress them or to make himself look big and good. He didn't use any of that. He used the power of the Holy Spirit to do this. 1 Corinthians 2, 3, And I was with you in weakness and in fear. Paul, you mean you got weak? Yes, he did. You mean you got afraid? Yes, he did. And in much trembling, things caused him to tremble. A great man of God like that. And then you worry about sometimes having a little problem. You get afraid or you have some kind of problem. And you say, well, you know, I couldn't be a Christian for having the problems I have. You're looking at a man of God right here that had those problems. He even had a thorn in his flesh that God wouldn't remove. He suffered. He suffered much. He was. Th have you ever been thrown in jail for the cause of Christ? Not any of us. He was. But hey, he took it and kept going and said, I am uh, able to, uh, and I'm persuaded that no matter what I go through, whatever I, trial I face, to, uh, therewith to be content. Whatsoever state I'm in, he said, therewith to be content. He was content in Christ. So his task was big. It was tremendous, as a matter of fact. But it was plain. It was not difficult to understand a man like Paul because he got down to where they could understand what he was preaching. And if you get down to where people can understand, somebody will get saved sooner or later. Not only was his uh, message and his preaching plain, but it was purposeful. He had a purpose in what he was doing. Souls, souls, souls. Can we get soul conscious? I think our church really needs to do that. Really look at people, and I've said this many times, Look at everybody you meet every day as a soul that's going to spend eternity either in heaven or hell. And if you witness to that person, find out they're on the road to hell, then tell them about Jesus Christ and how to be saved. My friend, he was preaching one great message, Christ and Him crucified, and, uh, and the atoning work that Jesus performed for us. Amen. Paul suffered humiliation. He suffered bodily infirmities. He suffered mental distress and spiritual depression. 
the Bible clearly tells us all these things that Paul went through. And then at times he was afraid. But he, he liked the psalmist, whenever they became afraid, they trusted in God. You may become afraid sometime. You may, the devil may get on you and say, oh, you, you had not got what you say you've got. You tell the devil you're a liar. I'm believing what God said, and God's the truth. I'm not going to believe your lie. I'm going to believe the truth. The truth will make me free. The fr truth did make me free. And I'm going to stick with the truth. So you go on your way, Satan. So there were times that he experienced these things, but he kept on going for God, kept on looking for souls, kept on building churches, spreading the gospel. And when he got ready to die, he knew he was going to die. He was going to have his head chopped off by Nero's chopping block. On Nero's chopping block. But you know what he said? He didn't say, I'm afraid now. He didn't say, well, I'm scared to death. I'm worried to death. He said, I'm ready. I'm ready. Said it with victory in his soul. I'm ready. Cut my head off. I'm going to meet Jesus, and i got a crown waiting on me over on the other side. Praise God, you and I, we don't know how great it is over there waiting for us, waiting for us. He said if we'd be faithful, he'd reward us. He tells us that in his word. He'll reward us. So being faithful, you say, you know, I could have been home watching uh, some kind of show on television tonight, but I'm in church. And people think I'm stupid for getting up and coming to church for a while on Wednesday night. Let them call you anything they want to call you. But I'll guarantee you God sees everything you're doing. You go to Malachi, and God's got a book of remembrance, remember? He's writing down what we're doing. And, brother, he's going to show it up at the judgment seat. And if we're faithful, and that's the only great requirement he gave, he said it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So be faithful. Be faithful. Don't let anybody change you from there. So Paul was alone in, at times, surrounded by masks of heathens. This mass heathenism was all around Paul, and fear and self-sufficiency of evil men were all around Paul all the time. In 1 Corinthians 2, 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world under, uh, under our glory. Now, he said there were things God kept secret, God didn't reveal to everybody, but right here he says, but I'm seeing things that I never saw before. God is showing me things. And so he showed Paul some mysteries. He revealed them to Paul, like the mystery of the kingdom of heaven or of the blindness of Israel, or of the rapture of the church, or of the mystery of iniquity, or the mystery of godliness. All these mysteries, and like I said a while ago about the rapture, behold, I show you a mystery. been a mystery, but I'm going to show it to you. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So Paul saw all of that. God gave him that because of his faithfulness. We were dead, but now... We're alive. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God has for us. And you know what he did, went on to say? But he said he's revealed them unto us. Unto whom? Unto the Bible writers. Those that pen the scripture down, Paul said God revealed these things to us so we could pen them down. So all you'd have to do is look at the revelation. There's the revelation right there, the whole book. And you and I, all we have to do is sit down and read it in the, in the peaceful place of our home or anywhere, our office or wherever we might be. Just sit down and read God's revelation. It's for us. It's for you. It's for me. And so then, are you alive tonight? Have you been born again? Have you been to Jesus? Have you asked Jesus to come into your heart? Okay. Praise God, you are alive from the dead. And you say, but you know, sometimes I don't feel like it. I ain't talking about feeling. You don't feel good all the time. We're in a physical body. And let me tell you something. This old flesh is not too good. You can't put any stock in the flesh because the flesh is no good on anybody. The flesh could let you down any time. Any given time, your flesh may let you down. But let me tell you something. The flesh is not going to glory in God's sight. We are going to go to heaven, not because we got good in the flesh. We put on a suit of clothes and a tie and say, Lord, look at me now. Do I look all right? You know, uh, are you proud of me? 
God doesn't look at that. He looks at the heart. He looks at the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks at that heart. And God knows my heart tonight. And he knows your heart tonight. And he knows whether you're trusting his son or not. He knows. And you know. You know where you are not. Don't go by feeling because you feel good one day and bad the next. I mean, the devil will leave you alone for a while, and then he'll come charging. I mean, it's just not the same every day. Boy, every day, if it would if just be like the glory I had a while ago while y'all were singing, man, I, I'd never get defeated. But praise God, we're not going to get defeated anyhow. We're going to keep trusting him, aren't we? Let's stand to our feet and bow our heads. And if you're here tonight, you're not saved. You're not alive. You're dead. You're still dead. But the altar is open any time anybody would like to come and pray, give your heart to the Lord, join the church, or do whatever we do around here. You can do it. Just feel free. The altar is yours. And all you have to do is just mind God. Not, just do what the Spirit of God would have you to do. Now, Father, we bow before thee tonight. We thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to be in church. Lord, we thank you for the plans that you have for us in the next few days. I pray that as we get into these things and carry them out, that they will all please you. Everything we do, let it please you. And I pray that